Well, last week, a, a physics nerd or two rescued me. This week, we have a DNA nerd rescuing me, and also a bit of a math nerd. And by the way, when I use the term nerd, that is a term of endearment. Hi, Tony DeWitt here. I'm a Missouri appellate attorney, retired, and I bring you a fresh perspective on the law without offering any legal advice. So pull up a chair. This is what we're discussing today. As I told you yesterday, or I guess Saturday, today is my 25th wedding anniversary. I have been married to the most wonderful woman in the world for 25 years. And that's not something to take lightly. I wake up every day absolutely amazed that my wife has put up with me for 25 years. She has gone with me different places when I've taken depositions. She has worked as my paralegal when I couldn't get paralegal support on a pro bono case. She has done an awful lot for me during that period of time. At the same time, she has taught uh, math, high school math and college math, and done a great job at doing that. She has students all over the world who love her to death. And of course, I love her to death too. So that's why I'm taking this time today. It, it's really important to me. But I wanted to leave you with this. This is going to be somewhat scientific and might be hard to follow, but hang in there. At the end, there is a TLDR that sort of explains what the conclusions are that you can draw from this DNA evidence. And I think that is absolutely golden and something you are going to want to just kind of keep close by. With that, on to the video. As you all know, I put the email address for the channel at the end of every video, and I do get a lot of emails, and a lot of them are very good. Every now and again, somebody gets a little spicy with their commentary, but those go into a special file all their own. When I do get really good emails, I like to share the content that comes in because a lot of people don't have YouTube channels and don't would get nervous maybe trying to explain this, but they can write it out and explain it pretty well. And that's what we have today. We have somebody who is explaining something really, really very well in the context of reasonable doubt. And this is an interesting one because it, it deals with the mitochondrial DNA that came from the little hair that could. So without further ado, let me jump into this email. I'm not going to identify the person who sent it because that's rude. If that person wants to identify themselves, they can certainly do that. But uh, right now, I, I'm going to keep it just, just between us. So here's how the email starts off. The apparent hair got a pleasantly severe beatdown from the defense on several points that the jury ought to be able to easily understand, so perhaps my blathering on about it doesn't apply here because we already saw a keeping it simple stupid shredding of the method of collection and chain of custody. I happen to know quite a bit about mitochondrial DNA, genetic, genetic genealogy is my nerd hobby, and the testimony left out details that may have benefited the prosecution. Their failure to mention them causes me to think that it was purposeful because the details wouldn't help. You could roll all of those into one reason for reasonable doubt, the RD numbers that I talked about earlier, and call it failure to request adequate comparison testing testimony by the outside lab. Said this time and time again that in addition to what the prosecution presents, it's also important to look at what they don't present. Not only is the evidence they gather important, the evidence they ignore is probably even more important. The witnesses they don't interview, that sort of thing. So that's essentially what our emailer here is getting to in her comment in that she's saying, look, the thing of it is, they didn't do a very good explanation on this DNA. So let's look at this a little bit further. So this is her reason 75. The expert witness never revealed the haplogroup of Peggy O'Keefe's mitochondrial DNA. Google states that O is the most common, and it's also almost exclusively Chinese. Almost half of native Western Europeans are some form of haplogroup H. 
If Peggy O'Keefe's mitochondrial DNA was haplogroup O, you can bet the Commonwealth would have beaten that factoid into the juror's head with the suspects that we didn't test. To heck with the suspects we didn't test. Boston's known to be heavily Irish, and we are looking at McCabe's, Alberts, etc. My presumption is that J.O.'s mitochondrial DNA is common to Europe and Boston cops. In other words, they're, not, they're playing statistical games here with the mitochondrial DNA. RD number 76, missing statistics from the mitochondrial DNA expert. The Commonwealth's mitochondrial DNA expert didn't testify as to the percentage of the population excluded from being consistent with the mitochondrial DNA contained in the apparent hair. There is a number, and that number has a notable range of possibilities. On the one end, it could all but eliminate reasonable doubt. On the other end, it could expand the eligible pool of contributors to a number that makes any testimony about that hair irrelevant. Why bring a witness who isn't bringing a money quote? There co might be a corollary to number 75, but even with Western European haplogroups, some are more rare than others. So we're going to her number 77, Andre Porto's glitch on the stand. The mass crime lab expert mentioned he tested the root end, not the shaft end of the apparent hair. He said that the lab was unable to extract any human DNA from the root end. Then he literally glitched on the stand, like his notes said something that he'd been told not to say. The part is suspicious all by itself, but it might not be good enough to be a reasonable doubt on its own. The, that part I picked up on immediately, but the rest of what I watched isn't quite fair to expect the jury to pick up on because it's based on what I noticed while re-watching this testimony and researching the other lab, the one that did the mitochondrial DNA testing. The Commonwealth asked if the mass lab had sent an extraction to the other better lab. The fumbling from the witness and the CW raised my suspicions based on what I know now and the defense could find out if this case ends up retried for a third time. So we go to the number 77. The rest of the story the defense could use if I'm right that number 71 was a clunky way to obfuscate information. I researched Bode Technologies. Their website boasts about their process to extract autosomal Y-DNA STR data from the hair shaft. They are claiming they can get this DNA from a hair shaft. The mass lab stated they had a root end which is usually enough to get some autosomal Y-DNA STR data from, but they couldn't. So they sent it to the lab that claims a 75% extraction rate when they don't even have a root. Just watching it again, now it's even more suspect that, than when I first looked up Boat. Based on what I saw, but more so on what I didn't see, now that I know what I know, Bode said they got a shaft, not a root. Mass said they had a root. Why didn't CW send them the root? The Bode uh, mitochondrial DNA person testified with way too many details regarding the process used to get the mitochondrial DNA, so many that it seemed re to resemble their patented extraction process to get nuclear DNA and STRs from a shaft he didn't do the extraction process, but he didn't do the extraction process. He did a regular extraction process. It ought to be the same process the mass lab did to extract JO's DNA from the known blood sample. Too many details coming from the witness after the witness that might have used the same process on the, twi on the taillight DNA tests had they been thorough, or even if, if, if they even did those tests. So many details that it raised two more reasonable doubts in my mind, even if all this other confusion resulted from lawyers trying to play with science. Off topic, but if Bode can really extract autosomal DNA from a rootless hair shaft, they are sitting on a gold mine if they can get the cost down under $1,000, under $1, they'll be swamped with every genetic genealogist who finds or kept an old hairbrush. And boy, do I ever agree with that. Sanger sequencing for the mitochondrial DNA, but not for the taillight autosomal DNA, or Proctor and Buchanan samples. Sanger sequencing is the best test of any DNA. That includes autosomal DNA and Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. STRs are a poor man's version of Y-DNA testing compared to Sanger sequencing. Back to the taillight. They said they did STR testing. They didn't specify whether, whether that was Y-STR testing or simply autosomal. Doesn't matter. For less than $2,000, they could have done Sanger sequencing on the Y-DNA of O'Keefe, Buchanan, and Proctor 
and reduced all those numbers down to knowing whether the unknown DNA sample came from Buchanan, Proctor, or a member of the Albert family if they'd bothered to get one. If the Commonwealth can buy a Lexus, surely this dollar is a drop in the bucket. I'm even more upset now that I realize this little cost saver. Our DNA expert here goes on. 95% certainty that the mitochondrial DNA from the hair could not exclude J.O. as the contributor. They matched the apparent hair to, to a J.O. known hair. They ought to have been able to come to a greater 90, than 95% certainty of exclusion, far greater, unless the way they were using that statistic isn't the way they portrayed themselves as using it. They testified to testing two of three testable regions. They made a correct testimonial regarding the HVR1 and HVR2 regions being hypervariable, but they left out the fact that the coding region, even though it is slow to mutate, anchors the interpretation of the HVR1 and 2 regions and leads to a much narrower range of possibility. Maybe they ran the coding region test as well on the apparent hair, but just didn't mention it. But they could have tested Buchanan and Proctor for the mtDNA too. mtDNA is in every single cell in your body. They had DNA samples from both cops, which means they also had mtDNA from both cops, but they didn't test it. Again, the hair is silly evidence to begin with, but they tested the regular DNA on the taillight, in some manner at least, against Proctor and Buchanan. They could have run mitochondrial DNA as well to run it against the hair. It appears from the testimony that they weren't asked to. Well, so far we've had a lot of science in there, and it was probably hard to follow. But I thought it was important to present all of that because there are a lot of really smart people out there who can tell us if our DNA nerd here is really on track, and I suspect she probably is. But I put it out there because, again, I believe to the extent that we can, we should always tell the full picture if we have the full picture, and it sounds like to me that she does. But for those of us who are not DNA experts and who maybe don't really understand the difference between mitochondrial DNA and all those numbers and, and different letters and abbreviations she used, she provided a very thoughtful TLDR, too long, didn't read. And here it is. They skipped a lot of DNA tests that could have made their case much stronger. Sorry for the novel. This is one thing I know a little about. I wouldn't bring any of this up if I, if a juror, if I were a juror, unless the other jurors made it a CW proof thing. Here's a brief note on mtDNA, and it talks about genetic testing and all that. TLDR, here's the money quote. Exact matches with full mitochondrial DNA sequence are not uncommon. 95% confidence level that the MRCA, most recent common ancestor, is within 22 generations. Call it 550 to 650 years. That's before Plymouth Rock. So when they're matching it to a 95% confidence level, which sounds like really close, it's actually a common ancestor for the last 550 to 650 years. And then she pokes just a little bit of fun at me. She says, your wife was a math teacher, so so was I, K-9, in other words, K kindergarten through ninth grade. She will likely be able to absorb the info from that paper much more quickly, efficiently, comprehensively than I did. Let your wife explain it to you. That's the only reason I added it. You have absolutely no idea how long I've wanted to say that to a man about math and statistics. Thank you for that. Well, you are absolutely welcome. Isn't it nice to see that people combine and, and give their time and talents and, and try to clarify things for us and, and just do really, really nice things? You know, one of the things I always put at the end of this thing is, is that we should try to do one kind act today. This is a kind act, and it's not to be undervalued. I think very much that if everybody contributed what they all know, and I mean, you guys have been great in helping me because I didn't didn't do anything on that first trial. This has been really, really helpful, and I, I greatly appreciate it. If you have comments about the DNA, drop them in the comments down below. That's what I have for you today. I hope you found it helpful, interesting, or maybe both. If there's a subject you'd like me to discuss, please feel free to send me an email at the address above. If you like what we do, please feel free to subscribe and come on back to the beach tomorrow. I release videos every weekday, weather and work permitting. If you have the opportunity today, do a kindness for your fellow man. 
It makes the world a better place one kind act at a time. And now, YouTube has some suggestions for other videos of mine that you might like. Thank you.